Okay, brilliant. Hello, everybody. By way of introduction, I would like to start not in the past, but in the present and in the future. On an island off the west coast of Finland, the nuclear waste repository on Carlo is currently under construction. This deep network of tunnels runs five kilometers underground, bored into stable, magnetic, nice bedrock. It employs materials ranging from cast iron and copper to pre-compressed bentonite clay to contain high-level radioactive waste. When the waste has been deposited, the tunnels will be sealed with concrete and the repository will be left to itself, abandoned, so to speak. Onkala will not be completed until the 2100s, and some of the isotopes contained within will stay dangerous to life for over 100,000 years. This means that this architecture involves the distant future as much, if not more, than the present. Thinking about Onkalo foregrounds questions of affect. It makes us consider how flows of energy and radioactivity permeate and penetrate materials, or can be resisted by their capacities to block such intensive flows. It makes us think about how processes of assembly, the bringing together of materials in both their actual state and their virtual potential, shape and transform places, landscapes, the earth itself. Thinking about Onkalo shifts us inevitably to a place that is both post-humanist, after all, how could we hold steady some transcendent idea of the human over this period, and post-anthropocentric in the terms of Rosie Bredotti and Rachel Krellin. Our consideration here cannot begin with human beings, but must start with relations, with affects, with the in-between. My paper today is not about Onkalo, it's about architecture from the past. But I find Onkalo a useful provocateur to help me develop an approach that revels in the affective and the post-anthropocentric. Later in the paper, when discussing Neolithic timber halls, we will see how sets of affective relations assemble flows of desire. In turn, these create spaces for different forms of engagement both with and beyond the human to emerge. Before turning to the past, however, I want to clarify what I mean by affect. This is tag after all, and I'm me. So we can't possibly go any further without a little philosophy. My work on affect follows Gilles Deleuze, both in his writing with Felix Guattari and his readings of Baruch Spinoza. Much more than the physical sensation of emotion, as we've been hearing already today, the concept of our affect allows us to attune ourselves to the relations that link people, places, things and materials. Affect flows through, around and over us. It spills past boundaries and links to our worlds. Whilst we might question precisely what the bodies of the future or the past might feel, approaching the question of affect through Deleuze allows us to recognise that to have a body at all is to affect and to be affected. Spinoza understands individual bodies as more or less stable configurations at the level of the body politic, the organism or smaller, as organic or mineral. Individuals emerge as specific ratios of speeds to slowness, as rhythm. As such, Spinoza provides a way of rethinking structures and of individuals such that structure is rhythm, to quote Deleuze, and bodies emerge through their relation with other bodies. Deleuze makes this clear, quoting him again, If I learn to swim or dance, my movements and pauses, my speeds and slownesses, must take on a rhythm common to that of the sea or my partner, following a more or less stable, sorry, more or less durable adjustment. Motion is central to Spinoza's philosophy of bodies. Different forces, for example, gravity, wind, light, other bodies, continually affect material bodies. These affections push and pull bodies, varying their ratio of speed and slowness. Where these bodies impact on each other, they affect each other. They impress on or change the state of the other. Rachel's hand, example of the handshake earlier gives a really beautiful example of that, I think. What Spinoza gives us, then, is a position from which we can consider affects as always on the move. Affect happens when bodies impress upon each other, when they change the relation. Working through concepts of affect is how Deleuze seeks to answer the question he sees as central to Spinoza's philosophy. What can a body do? Not what it is or what it might be, but what can it do? Bodies here are not human necessarily, nor are they neatly bounded. As Deleuze shows us with his famous analysis of von Uxel's discussion of a tick, even this most simple of creatures lives its life oriented uh, around three affects, a sensitivity to light, the smell of a mammal, and the heat topography of that mammal's skin. Affects stretch beyond the living and beyond the organic too. They embrace the vibrancy of matter, as Jane Bennett would put it. This approach leads Deleuze, both alone and his writings with Atari, to define bodies along two dimensions, latitude and longitude. The former refers to the affects a body is capable of, its intensive virtual capacities. 
The latter refers to the specific extensive actual relations of movement and rest that a body undergoes. By mapping these two aspects, Deleuze argues, we can define what a body can do. This consideration of a body along two dimensions allows Deleuze to argue that bodies of different orders or species can have much in common. The cart horse, he remarks, has more in common with the ox than with a racehorse. The process of defining bodies along these two dimensions is one of mapping. Bodies are always on the move, they are nomadic, and so only a cartographic <coughs> method, as Brodotti has defined it, will do. Brodotti's cartographic method poses questions. What relations do bodies have, and where do those relations go? What connections, topological and Euclidean, do they form? And what kinds of intensive force flow along them? Affect is critical here as one of the principal dimensions along which a cartographic mapping takes place and through which we can answer the question, what can a body do? What does this mean for architecture? First, we can recognise that architectures are bodies too, defined by longitude and latitude, which change and shift. They are always on the move. With bodies that blur, architecture is never separate from the ongoing processes of which it is part. In an archaeological context, one cannot mention architecture without thinking of Leslie McFadden currently running a session on architecture somewhere down the corridor. McFadden reminds us that architecture is imminent, that it does not exist as final form. Rather, it emerges in the ongoing interweavings of people and materials, the bodies that carry each other, prop each other up, cover each other and seal each other in. Here I think a cartographic method for mapping the effective nature of architecture opens up a powerful tool for thinking about the, these processes in ways that knit materials, spaces, times and people together. This is a method that embraces the imminence McFadden insists on and situates it within the post-anthropocentric becoming of the world. So to explore this approach briefly, let's turn to timber halls, a kind of architecture from the first few centuries of the British Neolithic. In total, we have 15 or so of these structures, 15 metres more in length, or, or more in length, rather, which contrasts with more numerous smaller examples. The association of timber halls with early Neolithic dates has led some archaeologists to see them as the footprint of pioneering colonists. Others, like Julian Thomas, have argued they were critical technologies for the production of house societies. Rather than wading into this debate, however, I want to concentrate on what a cartographic approach to affect might tell us here. We can start with Warren Field in Scotland, a single timber-built structure 24 metres by 9 metres. Constructed between 3810 and 3760 BC, the site was in use for less than 50 years. It was built with the use of round and split timbers and segmented wall trenches, with a series of four internal partitions. In addition, there were two large axial posts that do not appear to have played any significant functional purpose in the construction. How could we map the latitude and longitude of this site? Let's begin by thinking through the materials involved and map their connections. Woods such as alder, ash, willow and oak were used for different elements of the construction and in different parts of the building. Oak was particularly emphasised at the eastern end of the structure. Here we can map the intensive affects of various woods. they are different textures that could be brought out by running hands over them. they are different smells, the different landscape associations they carried with them the way they supported other bodies of wood, or turf, or brush. These were affective connections, flows of force that pressed in on the senses of the people who propped up posts with their bodies, or shaped the planks to form <coughs> walls, as McFadden has discussed in relation to Long Barrow building, or applied fire to some of the posts to help prepare them for cutting. This is what Deleuze means by latitude. These affective relations emerged through and alongside the encounter between different bodies, human and non-human, the movements of motion and rest, that created the site as a particular kind of place. Some material and human bodies rested here, others moved elsewhere. We can map further connections, how the site bound the local landscape to it, reaching out to a nearby axial line of Mesolithic pits recut in the Neolithic. The River Dee flowed just to the south, and the building's open western end would have gathered in its sights and sounds, the motion and rest of water <laughs> shaping and being shaped by the capacity it had to sustain people and animals' lives, longitude and latitude together. As the building was used, so plants were brought in and consumed, and the remains of animals cooked in pots were incorporated too. Here again, affective connections flowed between people, animals, plants and places, between past and present, as bodies moved and rested. These are not the product of architectural design, or at least not the product of that alone, but rather the unexpected outcome of the affective interaction of people, things, animals and places that produce a specific set of intensive <coughs> connections. 
The architecture of Warren Field emerged as these things came together, territorialised in the language of assemblage theory, in the heat, smell, sounds and tastes, as much as in the shape of the structure itself. These shifting cascades of collaboration and complexity, to quote Anna Singh, assembled the site through their effective connections. They were history in the making, to quote her again. Timber halls emerged through what Singh calls the eruption of difference, the ways in which affect and capacity, movement and race, rest, shape and are shaped by different bodies, each themselves caught up in becoming. We can think about this in conjunction with Whitehall Stone, a timber hall constructed between 4065 and 3940 BC and abandoned around 300 years later. In contrast to Warren Field, <coughs> Whitehall Stone has been convincingly argued to be the product of two building offence, with one 10 metre long structure being added to by a second to form a single linked building. Construction was not the first Neolithic act of this locale. There are earlier pits at the site, but building the hall differentiated this space in a way that would persist for centuries. New capacities for affect, new relations of motion and rest were created, a new body that could be mapped in new ways. Part of this may have paralleled the changing landscape around the site, the opening up of patches in the forest with new heterogeneous gatherings of animals and plants. These changes would have created a surplus of wood, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which cannot, as Keith Ray and Julian Thomas have noted, be simply conceptualised in economic terms. Trees had history. Their removal, the opening up of spaces where their absence would be noted, created different affective capacities in the landscape, involving new extensive links. These non-human bodies changed in both latitude and longitude. By severing trunks, wood gained the ability to move in new ways, and its mobile material, rich in the affective qualities of memory, may have demanded that the acts of building taking, take place. We normally suggest that people chop down trees in order to turn them into a material with which they can build. Here we can suggest the opposite. The people built because they were surrounded by the remains of trees. New affective pressures, new flows of desire, people following materials, not necessarily the other way around. In both these examples, new ways of thinking emerge once we embrace this cartographic approach, an approach that involves the mapping of latitude and longitude, intensive and extensive relations, the capacities to affect and be affected, the change in bodies, and the experience of that change. Archaeology offers sophisticated tools in this regard. Our methodologies and our theories are fundamentally about relation mapping, whether we are thinking of stratigraphic relations we map in our fieldwork, the relations revealed in microware analysis, material provenancing, or whatever. <coughs> Each of these tools is a means of mapping what Tim Sorensen and I called almost a decade ago the affective field. Almost a decade ago. Where does that time go? Seriously. <laughs> Yesterday we were submitting that paper to Dialogues. Unbelievable. By reconceptualizing architecture as a body in a process of becoming, and by asking ourselves what can this body do, we can begin to map these relations. We can use this to contribute to a post-anthropocentric view of architecture. Affect here is the critical bridging link between the different bodies, which allows us to conceptualize these relations as full of force and desire and power. Such an approach up opens up new ways of thinking about architecture, where the human is critical, but decentered, imminent, not transcendent. Materials play their roles, and the landscape does too. These non-humans have their own desires and their own effects. Such an approach to architecture allows us to reconceptualize the timber halls of the early Neolithic as it, as it does the future architecture to come on Carla, where I started this paper. It allows us to think of architecture that is beyond the human, with the human, and more than human. It enables us to map the complex, multidimensional flows of affect that allow us to understand what it is that an architectural body can do. Thanks very much indeed.